We turn in the Heidelberg Catechism to the Lord's Day 39. Lord's Day 39. What doth God require in the fifth commandment? That I should that I show all honor, love, and fidelity to my father and mother, and all in authority over me, and submit myself to their good instruction and correction with due obedience, and also patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities, since it pleases God to govern us by their hand. So far in our study of the Ten Commandments, beloved, we have looked at the first table of the law. You will remember from Exodus that Moses came down from the mountain carrying two tablets of stone. And we have divided those two tablets into the first and second table of the law. The first table of the law concerns especially our duty toward God and can be summarized by Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And then the second table of the law is our duty toward man. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We saw the first four commandments. The first commandment, worship God alone. The second commandment, worship God only as he has commanded you. The third commandment, worship God with the correct attitude and reverence. And the fourth commandment, worship God especially on his day of rest. The second commandment, or the second table of the law, now tells us about our duty to our neighbour. But again, we do not get to pick and choose how we are to show our love toward our neighbour. God tells us how we are to do that. We look at the second table of the law and we see we are called to love our neighbour in various particulars. The fifth commandment tells us we love our neighbour in his office or position. The sixth commandment tells us we love our neighbour by loving and protecting his life. The seventh commandment tells us we love our neighbour by loving and protecting his purity. The eighth commandment tells us to love our neighbour in his possessions. The ninth commandment tells us to love our neighbour in his good name or reputation. And finally, the tenth commandment tells us we are so to love our neighbour that we are not even to desire anything that belongs to our neighbour, to take it for ourselves. And all of this, all these Ten Commandments are given to us because we are to show our gratitude, our thankfulness to God for delivering us from all of our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember again the three divisions of the Heidelberg Catechism. Our misery, our deliverance, and finally our gratitude. We show our gratitude by obey, obeying the Ten Commandments. Let's look then at the Fifth Commandment under this theme. Honouring God-ordained authority. Honouring God-ordained authority. First, the authority then the attitude we have toward that authority, and then finally the possibility of so honouring God-ordained authority. The Heidelberg Catechism explains the fifth commandment by saying that we must honour father and mother and all who are in authority over me. So it's wider than simply saying Father and mother. It includes all who are in authority over me. We must therefore understand that concept, authority, and how it differs from power or might. Power or might is the ability to do something. Because one has the physical 
or intellectual strength to do it. Authority is the right to exercise that power, the right to rule. And the authority of a person does not depend upon their power or their might. For example, at the end of the life of King David, he was old and he was feeble and he was confined to his bed, we read. Yet, he still had the authority to rule Israel, and he did. For example, his son Adonijah declared himself to be king against the express commandment of God, and David was able, even as king, feeble as he was, to say, No, Solomon shall be king. He was able to overrule the scheme of Adonijah, even though he was physically weak. Your boss at work might be a weakling, physically and intellectually, but he's still the boss. You might have much better education than he does, you might be physically stronger than he is, but he is still the boss because he has a position of authority over you. Perhaps you think, I could be a much better boss than he is. No matter, he has authority over you. And there comes a time when children become teenagers, and especially teenage boys, and they discover that they are now stronger physically than their mother or their father. And they believe also that they are more intelligent than their mother and their father. There comes a time when mother and father are no longer able, for example, to help them with their homework. Yet, father and mother, even if they're weaker, still have authority over their sons and their daughters. They have the authority in the home. Perhaps a wife is intellectually superior to her husband. Perhaps she possesses all kinds of gifts that her husband simply does not possess. No matter, the husband is still the head in the home. He has the authority, not the wife. The same is true in the church. Perhaps the elders in the church are much less intelligent than you are. Perhaps they've got fewer gifts, or it seems to you they have fewer gifts than you have. Christ, however, has given them a position of authority, and therefore they have the right to rule over the members in the church. So simply having power does not give one authority, and not having power does not negate authority. On the flip side, the mere possession of power doesn't give one the right to rule. Might is not necessarily right. Just because a man possesses certain gifts in the church, for example, does not give him the right to declare himself to be the minister or the elder in the church. He might have superior gifts to the men who have been elected lawfully by the church. He may not exercise those gifts in the office of elder or deacon or minister unless he has the office, the calling, the position of authority. That, of course, is the answer to the question of women in church office. The Bible is very clear that God only calls men to the offices in the church. Women might say, a woman might say, but I have gifts. I have speaking abilities. I have gifts in insight into the Bible. I have gifts in caring and pastoral work and so on and so forth. The answer is not to say, no, you don't have those gifts. The answer is to say, yes, you have gifts. But God does not permit you to use those gifts in 
this particular sphere in the church. Yes, you may use your gifts. By all means, use your gifts, but not to usurp authority in the church. So physical strength, mental abilities, abundance of gifts does not give a man or a woman authority in any sphere of life. He must have a position, a position which gives him the right to rule. That authority or that right to rule gives someone the right to determine the lives of his or her subordinates, those under that authority, those over whom he or she rules in various spheres. Authority then gives one the right to make rules, to legislate in various spheres of life. For example, in the home, in the marriage, the husband is the head of the home. He has the right, therefore, to make rules for his wife and for his children. For example, he has the right to tell his wife, you may spend money in this area, but not in this area. He may say to his children, here are the rules in the house. You must obey them. You must do the following chores. This will be your bedtime. You must turn off the computer now, and so on and so forth. Of course, a wise husband and father will delegate some of that authority to his wife and to the mother of the children. And they also must listen to their mother when she says, time for bed, and so on. In the church, too, elders have authority to make rules or legislate for those who are subject to them. In the school or university, the teacher or headmaster or lecturer, he has authority. He has the right to make rules for his students. And in the civil government, we have the same thing. Kings, presidents, a prime minister, a Taoiseach, politicians, police officers, security officials, all of them have authority to make rules and to legislate for the citizens. Also, this authority means that they have the right to expect submission and obedience to those rules, and furthermore, the right to punish those who do not comply with those rules. In the home, the husband and the father has the right as the head of the home to expect that his wife and children obey the rules which he has set down. He is rightly displeased when they do not obey those rules and he has the power, the authority to punish, especially the children, when they disobey such rules. Thus it is too in the school or university. The teacher has the right to determine rules and to expect the pupils or students to listen to those rules and to punish disobedient children and students in his classroom, as it is in the church. Elders have the right to make rules for the members of the church and expect due honor and due obedience and have the right also to punish members of the church who are insubordinate. In fact, rebellion against the office bearers in the church is itself sin because it is a sin against the fifth commandment. The boss, the employer in the workplace, he too has the right to make rules for his employees and the right to expect that those rules will be obeyed and the right to punish employees who will not listen to his voice. For example, the employee who is always lazy, always late for work, he could be fired. It's true also in the civil government. They make rules, they have the right to expect those rules to be obeyed and they have the right to determine punishment for citizens 
who do not obey those rules. Authority gives one the right to give rules over those you are authority over and the right to punish those who will not obey. That's authority. Now this right to rule, this authority in every sphere of life is the reason behind the fifth commandment. Remember, all of the commandments are somehow rooted in the character or being of God. They reflect the perfections of the lawgiver himself. The first commandment is rooted in God's unity. There is one God. The second in God's spirituality. The third in God's holiness. The fourth in God's covenant fellowship. And now the fifth rooted in God's sovereignty and omnipotence. Because all authority is given by God himself. Romans 13 is, of course, the classic passage in this regard. And here Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And remember, who was in charge then? The Roman Empire, a monstrously wicked man, most likely Nero himself. Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be. That is to say, the powers which exist are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. But Paul is saying, don't resist the power. Don't resist those who have authority over you. Because if you do, you are resisting the ordinance of God, and those who resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Peter writes the same thing in his first epistle. Both men, of course, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 13 and following. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. And that word king is emperor in the context of the Roman Empire. Or unto governors. Think, for example, of Pontius Pilate. He was a governor as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honour all men, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honor the king or the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So God has ultimate power and God has ultimate authority and he gives that power and authority unto men. And so the fifth commandment is rooted in God's power and omnipotence. It makes no sense to say, honor thy father and thy mother, unless father and mother have authority. And where did they get this authority from? But from God himself. And this is true of all authority figures who are in our lives. God then has power. He has omnipotence. He is all-powerful. By that power he called the world into being. By that power he upholds everything that happens in this world. Controls everything. Every aspect of life is under his power. He has power and he has authority also. He is the Lord. He is sovereign. He determines what is done by all his creatures. From the insect crawling across the ground 
to the king who sits upon his throne, to the politicians who gather themselves together to discuss things in the halls of the government, to you and to me sitting on our pews this morning. God rules. God alone rules. Without his will, nothing happens in heaven or on earth. And that was the confession forced from the mouth of proud Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, verse 35. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the most powerful man of his day. He had authority given to him by God, but he had to confess that that power came from God. And all the inhabitants, Daniel 4, 35, of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he, that is Jehovah God, doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now the point of the fifth commandment is that God's good pleasure is to exercise his authority through means. And so he has established various spheres of authority among men whereby he subjects some men to the rule of other men, where some men are governed and some men govern according to God's own good pleasure. That's the end of Lord's Day 39. Since it pleases God to govern us by their hand. That was always the way. Think back to the very beginning of human history. God appointed Adam to be the head of the human race and to be the head over all the creation and said to Adam that you have dominion over all of the animals, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea, and you have dominion also over your wife Eve and you will have dominion over your children after you. That was the basic unit of authority, the family. And from there, we have other spheres of authority, including the state and the church. God then did not create men autonomous, which is to say self-ruling or self-governing, but in relationships. Some men have authority in various spheres and are under authority in other spheres. Take, for example, a husband. He has authority in the home over his wife and children. He goes to work and he is under the authority of his employer. He pays his taxes and he is under the authority of the state. He comes to church. He is under the authority of the office bearers in the church. And so some are under authority, some have authority, and in various spheres of life, you are either under authority or you have authority. This becomes clear, for example, in the situation a few years ago when the President of the United States of America was involved in terrible sin. He was the leader of the United States of America. And yet, he was a member of the Southern Baptist churches. Therefore, he was subject to the authority and even church discipline of his church. Now, of course, his churches, as far as I'm aware, did not actually exercise that authority, but they had the right to, and that's the point. No man is without authority. Some have it, some are under it, some have it in various spheres, and they're under it in various spheres. And so the chain of command is this. God is supreme. He has ultimate authority. 
under God is Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says that the head of Christ is God. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. We must, however, not misunderstand that verse. That is not true within the Trinity. The Son is not subject to or under the authority of the Father within the Trinity. But it is true of Jesus Christ, the man, in our human nature. The mediator, Jesus Christ. He is under the authority of the triune God. And God is pleased to rule all things through Jesus Christ. So God, Christ, when we read of Christ, he has all power in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28. That word power is authority. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He has the name which is above every name. And through Jesus Christ, God exercises his authority. Christ gives unto each man the authority which he has. And Christ commands to each man to submit himself to whatever authority there is in his particular life. So God, Christ, man, and then woman, under man, in particular, wife, under husband, and then children under wife and husband. All of these are authority figures. And all kinds of spheres in our life mean that we are under authority. For example, in the home, in the school, in the church, and in the state. This means that all authority figures rule on behalf of God and under God and are answerable to God for how they have exercised the authority given to them by God. God will therefore require it of all unfaithful office bearers, all unfaithful authority figures. This is true of the authority figure in the home. God will require it of unfaithful husbands and fathers who have led their wife and children tyrannically or neglected to lead them in the way in which they should go with the result that their wife and children perish. God will require that at the hand of unfaithful husbands and fathers on judgment day. This is true also in the workplace. God has given men positions of authority in the workplace, for men and bosses and so on. Those who have mistreated their employees, who have defrauded them of their wages, who have made their lives miserable by giving them terrible working conditions in which to work, they will be answerable to God on the last day. God will avenge that. True also in the civil government. The government who has unjust laws fails to protect their citizens, indeed their unborn citizens, fail to punish evildoers by allowing crime to be rife in society, failing to put to death murderers and rapists and so on, those who persecute the good, such as Nero did, all of them will have to answer to God on the last day. I give you authority, God will say. And this is how you ruled over the people, especially over my people. True also in the church. Pastors, elders, deacons who lord it over the flock of Jesus Christ who do not feed the flock and guide them in the green pastures of God's word, but rather scatter the flock and use them for their own ends, God will require that too from those pastors, those unfaithful pastors on the last day. And this means that no man is a law unto himself. We have authority, some of us more than others. We submit to authority, 
in every sphere of life to the glory of God in conscious dependence upon God. A man who is a husband or father must exercise that authority in conscious dependence upon God and to the glory of God. And so in every sphere of life where authority is exercised, anything less is sin. We saw that in Colossians, which we read together. Chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit as it is fit in the Lord. Verse 20, children obey, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Verse 22, servants obey, fearing God. Same is true of masters. Chapter 4, verse 1, masters give, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. And verse 23 sums up, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men. That's the authority which underlies the fifth commandment of God's law. We are to honour our father and our mother. Therefore, we are to have the proper attitude to that authority which God has given to some. We are called to honour authority. The Heidelberg Catechism explains the fifth commandment by demanding a threefold attitude of honour, love and fidelity to father and mother and all those who are under authority. We saw already in the third commandment that to honour comes from a word which means to be heavy and therefore means to respect to esteem as valuable or important, to recognize the worth or the value of something or someone. And this begins in the home with father and mother, but is extended to every sphere of life which we have already mentioned. When a son or a daughter sees father or mother, they must think along these terms. This person has value. This person is important. I must listen respectfully to this person and treat this person always with respect, even if I do not agree with him or her. That's why, for example, in former times, a son would say to his father, Sir, and children would rise from their seats when their parents would enter the room. It was a symbol of the fact that they esteemed them highly and recognized their authority. The same is true for other authority figures. When you see a police officer or a government official, a politician, the president or the Taoiseach, we must be impressed by their office by the fact that they have authority and accord them proper honour and respect. The same is true at school or in church. You don't say to your teacher, hey you, you say to your teacher, sir or madam. You address the police officer as officer. You don't shout insults at him, for example. You address the minister as pastor, for example. The opposite, of course, of honouring is to despise, to lightly esteem someone, to view someone as unimportant, or to make fun of them. Nowadays, we live in a time when children seem to have less and less respect for their parents. You look at the generation growing up around us and you think to yourself, juvenile delinquents, most of them are going to turn out to be. You see children speaking to their parents rudely in public. You see children even kicking their parents, even toddlers kicking 
their parents in public, swearing at their parents. And then when teenagers are on the scene, the way they treat their parents is often disgraceful. They treat their parents simply as a cash machine and they treat their home as a hotel and show no thankfulness or gratitude towards their father or mother and what those two people have done for them. The book of Proverbs has many warnings concerning what happens to boys and girls and teenagers who mock their parents. Chapter 30, verse 17 is a very stark warning. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. The idea there is of someone being hanged and the vultures coming and eating out the eyes of that child who had mocked and despised their parents. And of course in the Old Testament, a child who despised his parents and cursed his parents and would not repent was eventually brought to the elders of the church and then he was stoned to death. Today, of course, church members who break the fifth commandment and go on breaking that commandment and never repent are put out of the church through church discipline and eventually excommunication. But all of us are tempted in today's society to despise the authority set over us by God and therefore to break the fifth commandment of God's law. You only have to look at the general attitude of people in this country. The way they speak of the government, the lawful authority, the way they call them names and have nicknames, for example, for the Prime Minister or the Taoiseach. And there's a very fine line between a lawful disagreement with government policy and despising and dishonouring the government itself. And much for what passes for comedy today is nothing but a despising of the government and therefore a violation of the fifth commandment. Only open the newspapers or look at the television and you'll see the disrespect which greets many public figures who have authority over us today. Do not, therefore, despise, criticize, mock, think evil of, or speak evil of your parents, your teachers, your church leaders, or your government. That's the calling according to this fifth commandment. We are to love those who have authority over us. Especially, we are to love our parents. Not only to have affection for them, but also to seek their good. And we are to have fidelity or faithfulness or be loyal toward them. Remember, it's the, the first commandment in the second table of God's law, and we are shown here how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Children must love their parents, but more than that, they must show that love toward their parents by helping them in the home, for example, by showing to them in many different ways that they are thankful for the parents that God has given to them. And we are to love all authority figures in our life. In fact, the Catechism says we are to show them all honor, love, and fidelity. So we are to show love, for example, to the Taoiseach, the president, the police officer who pulls us over while we are driving, the traffic warden who gives us a ticket, the teacher who gives us a poor grade on our exam or gives us detention and makes us stay behind after class. That's the calling of the fifth commandment. 
We are to pray, therefore, for those who are in authority. We are to support them as much as we possibly can. We are to do nothing which would harm their interests, and we are to seek always their good. Even, mind you, if these authority figures are utterly unworthy of such love and fidelity. We read Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, and the apostles did not hesitate to call upon Christians to show that kind of honor to monsters of iniquity such as Nero, to emperors who were actively persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. The apostles sent by Jesus Christ with his message called upon the Christians to recognize and honor the authority of the emperor and the governors and all the rest. They never encouraged civil disobedience. They never said, let's overthrow the government and establish an earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. They did not even, mind you, attempt to abolish slavery. Instead, they said to the slaves of the congregation, Obey, submit to your masters in all things, even those who are forward, even those who are cruel to you. Do nothing which would dishonor them or undermine their authority. Christians, therefore, must honor unworthy and even ungodly parents and teachers and government officials. Yes, we may disapprove of their greed, irresponsibility, and wicked laws, but we, we may not dishonor them, and our attitude must always be one of honor and submission and respect. And that, of course, is difficult, requires much grace and much wisdom from on high. This attitude of honor, love, and fidelity is displayed in a threefold activity of submission, obedience, and forbearance. Submission is to put yourself deliberately under someone, and therefore is the opposite of rebellion. A submissive person will say, God has put this person in authority over me. Therefore, I will willingly and gladly put myself under him or her. I will recognize that authority and I will act accordingly. A submissive employee will not join a labor union and go on strike against his employer because he does not like his working conditions. He will not threaten his employer with ruin of his business, therefore. A submissive citizen will pay his taxes, even if those taxes are unfair. He will not organize rebellion against the government. He will not take place in a riot or a protest march through the streets to attempt by force of numbers to force the government to change its mind all rebellion against the state, all revolution, is against the fifth commandment. Submissive children will not be rude to their parents, or talk back to them, or talk back to their teachers at school. When their parents say, do this, they will do it. When their teachers say, homework is due by this day, they will do everything in their power to make sure their homework is done on time. When parents say, be home at a certain time, submissive children will say, yes, mom, yes, dad, and they will be home at that time. When parents say, time for bed, they will go to bed immediately when they are told. When parents say, turn off the computer now, or turn off the television, or put away your toys. Submissive children will do exactly as they are told. They will not complain, 
They will not grumble. They will not slam the door. They will do as they are told out of love for God himself. Remember, we don't keep the fifth commandment ultimately to please our parents or to gain brownie points with God or to gain salvation for ourselves. We keep the fifth commandment as we keep all of God's commandments out of gratitude to him who loved us and gave Jesus Christ for us. A submissive person, therefore, is an obedient person. They listen to what a superior has to say, and they do it cheerfully without grumbling from the heart. Colossians 3.17 says, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and to the Father by him. Colossians 3.22 says, Concerning servants, they are to do their work in singleness of heart, fearing God. And verse 23 says, Do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. All obedience at all times, with only one exception, which is when your obedience to your parents, or to the government, or to the teacher, or to your boss, would mean disobedience to God's law. Then we say with the apostle, we obey God rather than men. But in all other cases, no matter how unreasonable those requests might be, we are to comply with those who are in authority over us. We also show forbearance. That's included in our answer in the Heidelberg Catechism as well. Patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities. And here the Heidelberg Catechism is practical and realistic. It recognizes that in a fallen world, all authority figures under God are sinful authority figures. Sinners must submit themselves to sinners. Sinners have authority over other sinners, and therefore there will be weaknesses and there will be injustice in authority figures, and there will be temptations from those under authority to rebel against their masters. Now the calling of all superiors, all those who have authority, is to make obedience and submission to authority as easy and pleasant as possible. That's why Colossians 3 mixes together the calling of those who have authority with those who are under authority. It says that wives they must submit to their husbands, but it says to the husband he must love his wife and not be bitter toward her. Such a husband is a pleasure and a joy for a wife to submit to. Fathers must so love their children that they do not provoke them to anger and discourage them. Such parents are a joy for their children to submit to. Masters must give unto their servants or their employees what is fair and just and right. Fair wages, fair working conditions. Such masters, such employers will be a joy for employees to work for. But when this superior fails to do this, as is often the case in our fallen world, the calling to honor, love, submit, and obey stands. A wife must submit to a grumpy, unappreciative, unfeeling husband who never notices anything that her that her that his wife does around the home for him. Never says anything about the way she keeps the house clean for him or makes him delicious meals or looks after the children, but is a grumpy man, a bit like Nabal in the Old Testament, a fool. Yet the wife has still the calling to submit 
to that man. And children must not allow themselves to be provoked by foolish and sinful parents and must submit even to such sinful parents. Students and pupils must submit to that unreasonable teacher who gives extra homework on a Friday afternoon or the headmaster who acts like a tyrant and they must not go bad-mouthing him to their friends or writing things about him on the internet. And when the government official treats you badly or without respect, the policeman or the traffic warden or the man or woman in airport security, you must submit to them and never respond in kind. Always remain polite even when you are provoked. That's forbearance, bearing with their weaknesses and infirmities, indeed bearing with their sins. That's the keeping of the fifth commandment. Now we should see from all of this that we are not able to keep the fifth commandment by nature. We can't keep any of the commandments of God by nature. Because, especially concerning this commandment, we are all natural rebels. We want to have the authority. We want to do what we want to do. We do not want to submit to what others tell us to do. We want us to assert ourselves. And when we see the leaders around us, our parents, the politicians who rule over us, our boss, our teacher, the elders in the church, we begin to despise them in our hearts and say, you know, I could be a better leader than he or she. And then we seek to undermine their leadership in various ways by speaking about them behind their back or by plotting to overthrow them. And if in the providence of God we cannot be leaders, we become discontented with our lot. And we speak against them. We murmur against them. We complain about them, about our parents, or our spouse, or our teachers, or our church leaders, or our government. And if given the opportunity, we would attempt to overthrow them. Just as Absalom tried to overthrow his father, David, and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, Try to overthrow Moses in the wilderness. And how do we become such wretched, rebellious creatures? We learned it from our first parents, Adam and Eve. We received that rebellious nature from them. And they learned it, mind you, from the devil himself, who was the first rebel. The devil, although he was created good, with a lot of authority in the angelic world, he was not satisfied. He wanted to have the throne of God. He initiated a rebellion in heaven. Open rebellion, which led to him being cast out of heaven upon the earth. And there he came to Eve, especially convinced her to rebel against the authority of her husband Adam, to usurp his position. And having fallen, Eve encouraged her own husband Adam to rebel against God, and both Adam and Eve fell into sin, and now every human being born of ordinary generation from Adam and Eve is a rebel by nature, will not submit to God and will not submit to those whom God has put over him. And we all know there was only one exception to that. Only one person in the history of the world who perfectly submitted to all God-ordained authority, even the most unworthy authority. 
He bore with the weaknesses and infirmities of those that God, whom God had placed over him. Think of it. The Son of God became man, was born under the law, born under the fifth commandment of God's law. And here we have the Son of God in our flesh, submitting himself to Mary and Joseph. Mary, his mother, a sinful woman like all human beings, and Joseph, his adopted father. And yet, he was willing, for our sake and for the glory of God, to submit to Mary and Joseph. What condescension was that? And shall we not submit to our parents and those who have authority over us? And then, when he was a grown man, he continued to submit to authority. He said to his disciples that they must submit to authority. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. At the end of his life in particular, he submitted to authority. There he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when those who had lawful authority over Israel, the religious leaders of the Jews, sent their officers to arrest him. He could have said, I do not recognize your authority. You are wicked. I will not allow myself to be arrested. But he said, no. I am under the authority of the fifth commandment. I must obey my father. He has given me this cup to drink. He submitted to the authority of the Jewish Sanhedrin, allowed himself to be tried by them, even though they broke every rule in the book. He submitted himself to the governor himself, to Pilate. He said to Pilate, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. And yet he recognized the authority of Pilate, and did not complain or protest when Pilate said, Crucify him. He meekly submitted to that as well. All of that was submission to his father's will. He was the perfect son, and he is the perfect son. His father said to him, You must die upon the cross for the sins of your people. And never did Jesus say, No, Father, I will not do it. Why not? Because he loved his father. He loved the glory of his father. And he loved us, who are by nature rebellious sinners. And he knew it was the only way in which we who are rebels would be delivered from our sins. He took our rebellion upon himself and paid for all of our sins. His submission becomes our salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray for the grace to submit to all lawful authority in our lives because we recognize it is difficult for us to bear with the weaknesses and infirmities, yea, even with the terrible sins of those whom thou hast placed over us in thy providence. 